In the previous video, I discussed the origin and development of early Mormon concepts of authority and priesthood, from its charismatic beginnings to the introduction of evangelic ordination stories in the mid-1830s. Among other things, it was shown that from June 1829 to September 1834, the early Mormon concept of authority was charismatic-based and was given by divine command through revelation or derived indirectly from angelic ministration in association with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. In June 1829, Cowdery resisted forming a quorum of twelve apostles by issuing his own revelation. In June 1830, the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ mentioned only divine and angelic commandments as a source of authority and linked the apostleship with the office of elder. In June 1831, Joseph Smith introduced the high priesthood, which quickly evolved from elders with additional authority to the office of high priest. From July to August 1831, Joseph Smith visited Missouri and was involved in a jurisdictional dispute with Bishop Edward Partridge. In November 1831, Joseph Smith dictated a revelation calling him to be president of the high priesthood, which also explained that this new office was superior to a bishop. On the 25th of January 1832, Joseph Smith was ordained president of the high priesthood by Sidney Rigdon in Amherst, Ohio. On the 26th of April, 1832, Joseph Smith was sustained as president of the high priesthood at a meeting held in Independence, Missouri. In July, 1832, Joseph Smith learned that the Missouri church was once again in discord and that Bishop Edward Partridge was challenging his leadership. In the summer of 1832, Joseph Smith began writing his history the preamble of which outlined his special status as church leader. However, it did not mention angelic ordination, but rather the reception of the holy priesthood by the ministering of angels, apparently in association with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and the confirmation and reception of the high priesthood, which came by revelation in June 1831. In September 1832, Joseph Smith dictated a revelation that linked the high priesthood to Moses via Melchizedek and the lesser priesthood to Aaron, explaining also that an elder is an appendage to the high priesthood. This revelation also alluded to Malachi 3.3 to justify the continuance of the Aaronic priesthood. From May to July 1834, Joseph Smith led a quasi-military expedition of more than 200 Mormons to Missouri in an effort to return the saints to their lands in Jackson County. This effort failed, and the Mormons lost their holy land to their enemies. Joseph Smith experienced a fallout from this failure, and his leadership was questioned in both Ohio and Missouri. In September 1834, in a letter to W. W. Phelps in Missouri, Oliver Cowdery wrote the first account of his and Smith's ordination by an unnamed angel in May 1829, which was published in the Messenger and Advocate the following month. According to Cowdery, the angel's words anachronistically alluded to Malachi 3.3. On 5th of December 1834, Oliver Cowdery was ordained an assistant president by Sidney Rigdon. Cowdery's explanation for his sudden rise to the second highest office in the church, an excuse for the delay, is unconvincing and suspect. In February 1835, Cowdery organized the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, explaining that their authority was derived from the appearance of the angel to the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Between March and August 1835, Joseph Smith added mention of the coming of John the Baptist and Peter, James, and John to his early revelations. In this video, I will discuss Joseph Smith's and Oliver Cowdery's attempt to link their alleged angelic ordinations to ancient prophecy in September and October 1835 in Kirtland, Ohio. Joseph Smith's and Oliver Cowdery's claimed reception of additional priesthood keys from Moses, Elias, and Elijah during the Kirtland Temple dedication in April 1836. 
Joseph Smith's incorporation of the angelic ordination stories into his official history begun in April 1838 in Missouri. The possible date for the alleged visit of Peter, James, and John. Joseph Smith's attempt to support his new teachings on the spirit and power of Elias being connected to the Aaronic priesthood by claiming he learned it from John the Baptist in May 1829. Not only did Joseph Smith attempt to legitimize angelic ordinations by inserting mention of them in his early revelations, but he also contemplated making it appear that such ordinations were fulfillment of ancient prophecy. This episode begins with Joseph Smith's purchase of Egyptian papyri in Kirtland, Ohio in July 1835. In his description of this acquisition in the December 1835 issue of The Messenger and Advocate, Cowdery said the papyri included the writings of ancient patriarchs Abraham and Joseph. By this time, Smith had already started translating, or at least pretending to, keeping notes in what he called the grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language, and subsequently dictating what is now chapter 1 and part of chapter 2 of the Book of Abraham. Like any pseudepigraphist, Joseph Smith used this opportunity to support his new teachings on priesthood, particularly the notion of the high priesthood originating with Adam and being handed down from patriarch to patriarch in conformity with Doctrine and Covenants section 84, which had been dictated in September 1832. In his notebook, Smith pretended to translate the following. Ah, Bra O.M., a father of many nations, a prince of peace, one who keeps the commandments of God, a patriarch, a rightful heir, a high priest. Kaya Bra O.M., coming down from the beginning, right by birth, and also by blessing and by promise, promises made, a father of many nations, a prince of peace, one who keeps the commandments of God, a patriarch, a rightful heir, a high priest. Zul, from any or some fixed period of time back to the beginning of creation, showing the chronology of the patriarchs, the right of the priesthood, and the lineage through whom it shall be continued by promise, beginning at Abraham, signifying the promises made to Abraham, saying, Through thy priests, or the seed of thy loins, shall the gospel be preached unto all the seed, meaning from Noah, and unto all the kindreds of the earth. Ah, Broem, a follower of righteousness, a possessor of greater knowledge. Baeth Ku, the fifth high priest from Adam. Smith's September 1832 revelation had remarked that Abraham had received the priesthood from Melchizedek, but in his Abraham papers, Melchizedek is not mentioned. Instead, Abraham receives the priesthood from his fathers, and he, rather than Melchizedek, is called a prince of peace. Not surprisingly, Smith's dictation of the book of Abraham deals with legitimate and illegitimate claims to the priesthood, and opens with Abraham proclaiming his legitimacy. I, Abraham, sought the blessings of the fathers, and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same, having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge, and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge, and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive instructions and keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. It was conferred upon me from the fathers. It came down from the fathers from the beginning of time, yea, even from the beginning, or before the foundations of the earth to the present time, even the right of the firstborn, on the first man, who is Adam, or first father, through the fathers, unto me. Despite Smith's dictation, Cowdery's December 1835 description focused on the record or scroll of ancient patriarch Joseph, 
and its elaborate drawings of what he, and probably Smith, interpreted as representations of the three-in-one Godhead, a walking serpent, Enoch's pillar, and the judgment. Cowdery's fascination with the record of Patriarch Joseph became apparent in September and October 1835, when he copied 1833 blessings into a patriarchal blessing book, which he freely expanded and altered. Cowdery drew on information evidently obtained from Joseph Smith's translation of the Egyptian papyri. Before copying the 1833 blessings, Cowdery wrote an introduction to explain some of the content of the blessing Smith gave him on the 18th of December, 1833. He, Joseph Smith, was ordained by the angel John unto the lesser or Aaronic priesthood in company with myself in the town of Harmony, Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, on Friday, the 15th day of May, 1829, after which we repaired to the water, even to the Susquehanna River, and were baptized, he first ministering unto me, and after I to him. Note that Cowdery follows Smith's recent expansion to section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants in naming the angel John. Cowdery continues, But before baptism, our souls were drawn out in mighty prayer to know how we might obtain the blessings of baptism and of the Holy Spirit according to the order of God, and we diligently sought for the right of the fathers and the authority of the holy priesthood and the power to administer in the same. For we desired to be followers of righteousness and the possessors of greater knowledge, even the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. In describing what led them to the water's edge, Cowdery departs from his previous account, which claimed that they waited for divine command through revelation to begin baptizing. Now he anachronistically inserts the claim that they sought for the authority of the holy priesthood, which included the power to baptize. Even more problematic is Cowdery's borrowing of Smith's recent translation of the Book of Abraham to craft his description of a May 1829 event. Linguistic affinity between Cowdery's introduction to his blessing and the Book of Abraham is clear. Cowdery's introduction continues, Therefore, we repaired to the woods even as our father Joseph said we should, that is, to the bush, and called upon the name of the Lord, and he answered us out of the heavens. And while we were in the heavenly vision, the angel came down and bestowed upon us this priesthood. And then, as I said, we repaired to the water and were baptized. From Cowdery's statements, it would appear that Smith had made some preliminary remarks about the record of Joseph and was planning to produce further authority for his recent ecclesiastical innovations. Cowdery then alludes to the reception of another priesthood. After this, we received the high and holy priesthood, but an account of this will be given elsewhere or in another place. As far as can be determined, Cowdery never fulfilled this promise. However, he added more details about the event when he copied the blessings Smith supposedly gave him in 1833 into the record book in October 1835. According to Cowdery, Smith concluded the blessing by saying, These blessings shall come upon him, Oliver, according to the blessings of the prophecy of Joseph in ancient days which he said should come upon the seer of the last days, and the scribe that should sit with him, and that should be ordained with him, by the hands of the angel in the bush, unto the lesser priesthood, and after receive the holy priesthood, under the hands of those who had been held in reserve for a long season, even those who received it under the hand of the Messiah, while he shall dwell in the flesh upon the earth, and should receive the blessings with him, even the seer of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saith he, even Joseph of old. Amen. Although the original blessing given to Cowdery is not extant, comparison of other blessings with those copied into the Patriarchal Blessing Book indicates, as one Mormon scholar observed, 
that Cowdery greatly expanded the blessings beyond their contents as initially recorded. Comparison of the opening portion of the blessing to Cowdery in the blessing book with a synopsis recorded in Joseph Smith's journal under 18th of December 1833 indicates that Cowdery omitted a phrase not particularly kind to himself. Nevertheless, there are two evils in him that he must needs forsake, or he cannot altogether escape the buffetings of the adversary. If he shall forsake these evils, he shall be forgiven. Given this evidence, one should not take Cowdery's oath prefacing this copy of the 1833 blessings too seriously. These blessings were given by vision and the spirit of prophecy on the 18th of December 1833 and written by my own hand at the time, and I know them to be correct and according to the mind of the Lord. Smith's words drew on ancient Joseph's prophecy about the latter-day choice seer named Joseph, recorded in the Book of Mormon, but went well beyond what was contemplated in 1829 or 1833. Of course, Joseph Smith could not have alluded to ordination by an angel in the bush or unspecified apostles in December 1833, since the first had not been invented until September 1834, and the second until after February 1835. Nor does it seem likely that Smith would have expanded on the prophecy of ancient Joseph until after he began translating the Egyptian papyri in July 1835. Rather, the wording of the blessing reflects concerns Smith and Cowdery had at the time Cowdery was copying the blessings into the blessing book. Given this evidence, it is rather surprising that some apologists have attempted to use this source as evidence that angelic ordinations were discussed before Cowdery and Smith began talking about them publicly. Note also that the blessing apparently links the ordination by Peter, James, and John with the restoration of the holy, or high priesthood, whereas the additions to the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants ambiguously linked it to the apostleship. Obviously, Cowdery greatly benefited from this rewrite and falsification of early Mormon history, and therefore his testimony is suspect. Motivation for Smith and Cowdery's partnership is perhaps contained in the words of Smith's blessing, as recorded by Cowdery in 1835. He shall sit in the council of the patriarchs with his brother Joseph, and with him have part in the keys of that ministry, when the Ancient of Days shall come. For he shall have part with me in the keys of the kingdom of the last days, and we shall judge this generation by our testimony, and the keys shall never be taken from us, but rest with us for an everlasting priesthood for ever and ever." He shall be equal in the councils of Israel. While this statement was true in October 1835, it certainly wasn't in December 1833. There was evidently a need for a second witness since Smith's charisma was in question, as well as a need to thwart challengers and keep the church together. The claim of uninterrupted succession of ordinations back to one who had undisputed authority was a stabilizing force, for it relied more on office and legal right than on a continual display of charisma, which Smith had come to realize was undependable. The dedication of the Kirtland Temple on Sunday, 27th of March, 1836, was an occasion for an outpouring of spiritual phenomena. Milton V. Backman, Jr. has described this period as the Pentecostal season of Mormon history. During a 15-week period extending from January 21st to May 1st, 1836, Backman writes, probably more Latter-day Saints beheld visions and witnessed other unusual spiritual manifestations than during any other era in the history of the church. Commenting on this period of church history, Smith called it a Pentecost and an endowment indeed. However, even as the dedication of the temple occasioned this renewal of Pentecostal and charismatic fervor, 
It also underscored the ordered environment in which such fervor might be more or less safely allowed. For the dedication of the temple was also an occasion for the assertion of legalistic and institutional authority. The two priesthoods and their various ranks of authority were clearly displayed for all to see. Pulpits in three rows of ascending height had been erected at opposite ends of the temple, where the presidencies of the various quorums of the priesthood sat. During the conference, each of the presiding quorums and various presidents were presented for the sustaining vote of the membership. Thus, each man knew his place in the power structure, as well as the limits of what was allowed in ecstatic experiences. At this meeting, as Joseph Smith reported, I bore record of my mission and of the ministration of angels. On the following Sunday, 3rd of April, 1836, the temple again filled with saints, and Smith and Cowdery stepped behind the veils which had been lowered to conceal the pulpit at the front of the hall. According to Doctrine and Covenants, section 110, several visions opened to their view. First, Jesus Christ appeared, accepted the temple, and mentioned the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. Moses followed and gave them the keys of the gathering of Israel. Elias then appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham. Finally, Elijah appeared and declared that he came to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. He also announced that the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. Smith and Cowdery now held keys, which were not shared by other priesthood officers, and as joint presidents of the church, they were beyond the reach of any usurper. On 27th of April, 1838, Shortly after his arrival at Far West Caldwell County, Missouri, Joseph Smith with Counselor Sidney Rigdon and Clerk George W. Robinson began dictating what would become the official history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which he later began publishing in Nauvoo, Illinois in 1842 in the periodical Times and Seasons. Smith's history was an apologetic defense and a massive overhaul of his early history. Despite the promise to disabuse the public mind and put all inquirers after truth into possession of the facts, in truth and righteousness as they have transpired, Smith disingenuously denied his three-year involvement as a treasure seer, transformed his first vision from a personal experience into a foundational event of the Restoration, purged the story of the angel and plates of treasure lore and folk magic elements, and inserted the story of his and Cowdery's reception of the priesthood from John the Baptist. According to Smith, the Baptist said, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion, for the remission of sins. And this shall never be taken again from the earth, until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. Smith's version changes Cowdery's account to reflect information revealed in his September 1832 revelation by deleting reference to the holy priesthood, which the revelation associated with the high priesthood and having the angel specifically mention the priesthood of Aaron, and a description of the duties of the lesser priesthood that very closely follows the wording of D&C 84, verses 26 and 27. Of course, this was all anachronistic for the May 1829 setting, perhaps explaining the late public disclosure of this angelic ordination. Smith wrote that he and Cowdery we're forced to keep secret the circumstances of having received the priesthood and our having been baptized owing to a spirit of persecution which had already manifested itself in the neighborhood. 
While this might explain why they didn't tell the residents of Harmony, at least for the two weeks they remained in that neighborhood, it doesn't explain why Smith and Cowdery kept this information from the Whitmer family and others who joined the church in Fayette, New York, which neighborhood Smith admitted was much friendlier to his message. Nor does it explain why he maintained this secrecy for nearly five years in Ohio and Missouri. Clearly, this excuse is not credible. In his 1838 history, Smith made only passing reference to Peter, James, and John, reporting at the time he and Cowdery received the Aaronic priesthood, the Baptist told them that he acted under the direction of Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which priesthood, he said, would in due time be conferred on us, and that I should be called the first elder of the church, and he, Oliver Cowdery, the second. This is all the history says about this subject, except for when it quotes the amended revelations previously discussed. Those who argue that the visitation of Peter, James, and John occurred in the weeks following 15th of May, 1829, overlook the subsequent statement in Smith's history that after their arrival in Fayette in early June 1829, Smith and Cowdery had not yet realized the fulfillment of the angel's promise to have the Melchizedek priesthood bestowed upon them. We now became anxious to have that promise realized to us, which the angel that conferred upon us the Aaronic priesthood had given us, viz., that provided we continued faithful, we should also have the Melchizedek priesthood, which holds the authority of the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. We had for some time made this matter a subject of humble prayer, and at length we got together in the chamber of Mr. Whitmer's house, in order more particularly to seek of the Lord what we now so earnestly desired. We had not long been engaged in solemn and fervent prayer, when the word of the Lord came unto us in the chamber, commanding us that I should ordain Oliver Cowdery to be an elder in the church of Jesus Christ, and that he also should ordain me to the same office. Of course, the association of the eldership with Melchizedek priesthood is an anachronism, since that association was not made until the September 1832 revelation linked the office of elder with the high and holy priesthood, which in turn was linked to Melchizedek. Aside from the anachronistic language, the restoration of the eldership came through divine command, as the Whitmers and McLellan later claimed. Smith's history continues. We were, however, commanded to defer this our ordination until such times as it should be practicable to have our brethren who had been and who should be baptized assembled together, when we must have their sanction to our thus proceeding to ordain each other, and have them decide by vote whether they were willing to accept us as spiritual teachers or not. According to Smith's history, he and Cowdery ordained one another elders when the church was organized on the 6th of April, 1830. Some will want to assert, that the visit of Peter, James, and John occurred after the above event and before the organization of the church. However, a statement in Joseph Smith's Epistle to the Church, dated 6th of September, 1842, challenges this conjecture. And again, what do we hear? The voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna County and Colesville, Broome County, on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom, and of the dispensation of the fullness of times. This statement implies that the visitation occurred while Smith and Cowdery were traveling the twenty miles between Harmony and Colesville, and the only occasion Smith and Cowdery were together alone in this vicinity following their 15th of May 1829 baptisms, was in early July 1830. Within a week or two after their baptisms, 
David Whitmer arrived in Harmony and conveyed Smith and Cowdery to his father's home in Fayette, New York, where the manuscript of the Book of Mormon was completed about the end of June 1829. After making arrangements with the printer in Palmyra, Joseph Smith returned to Harmony in late September, leaving Cowdery in Manchester to prepare the printer's copy. Smith returned to western New York from late March to late April 1830 to organize the church and hold meetings. Smith and Cowdery visited Colesville in late April briefly and returned to Fayette where they held the first conference on the 9th and 10th of June. After conference, Smith returned to Harmony with his wife Emma, Oliver Cowdery, and David and John Whitmer. About the 25th of June, this company arrived in Colesville to hold a baptismal meeting. On the 30th, Joseph Smith was arrested and taken to South Bainbridge for trial on the old charge of being a stonegazer. After his acquittal the following day, Smith was arrested by a different sheriff and taken back to Colesville for a trial on the same charge. Smith was again acquitted, but still found it necessary to escape the mob. A few days after returning to Harmony, Smith and Cowdery visited Colesville, intending to confirm those who had been baptized, but were forced to flee from their enemies and return to Harmony. Of this event, Smith recorded in his 1838 history. We considered it wisdom to leave for home, which we did, without even waiting for any refreshments. Our enemies pursued us, and it was oftentimes as much as we could do to elude them. However, we managed to get home after having traveled all night, except a short time during which we were forced to rest ourselves under a large tree by the wayside, sleeping and watching alternately. The late reminiscence of Edison Everett, who said he overheard a conversation between Joseph and Hiram in Nauvoo in 1844, adds support to an early July 1830 date for this alleged visitation. Although Everett's account contains some inaccuracies, the historical setting he describes is consistent with Smith's 1842 statement. In Everett's version, Smith and Cowdery narrowly escaped being mobbed when attorney John Reed opened a window in the back of the courthouse and directed them to flee into the woods. Writing to Oliver Huntington in 1881, Everett said, They traveled all night in a dense forest, some of the time in deep mud and water. And in the after part of the night, Oliver Cowdery became exhausted, and he, Joseph, had to almost carry him. Just at the break of day, Oliver gave out and exclaimed, How long, O Lord, how long, Brother Joseph, have we got to endure this thing? There, said Brother Joseph, at that very time, Peter, James, and John came to us and ordained us to the apostleship. In an 1882 letter to Joseph F. Smith, Everett quoted Smith as having said, Just this moment, Peter, James, and John came to us and ordained us to the holy apostleship and gave unto us the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times, and we had some sixteen or seventeen miles to go to reach our place of residence, and Brother Oliver could travel as well as I could after the endowment. Now, as to time and place, I heard the name of the banks of the Susquehanna River spoken of, but where it was placed I cannot tell. As to time, I cannot be very exact. Some Mormon scholars have resisted this dating because they assume reference to Smith and Cowdery as apostles in the Articles and Covenants implies the ordination to the apostleship had already occurred. However, they are confusing the restoration of the eldership, which included the apostleship as stated in the Articles, as well as the charismatic calling of apostles through visionary experience, as in the case of Cowdery and David Whitmer, with the office of apostle in the Quorum of the Twelve. In contrast to those holding traditional assumptions, believing historians Richard Bushman and D. Michael Quinn have defended the later dating. Finally, in his 1838 history, 
Smith tried to link the 1836 appearance of Elijah in the Kirtland Temple to his 1823 vision of Moroni. According to Smith, Moroni quoted Malachi 4.5 with a change that foreshadowed the restoration of the priesthood keys 13 years in the future. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Of course, this was the anachronism of all anachronisms. Moreover, if Moroni quoted this passage differently, one would expect Joseph to have included the change in his inspired revision of the Bible, just as he included Nephi's version of Isaiah 29. Cowdery's 1834 and 1835 history quoted the angel's words and prophecies about the gathering of Israel in the last days at great length, but not one word about priesthood or Elijah. Obviously, it was an after-the-fact prophecy, and an attempt to smuggle later concepts of priesthood into an earlier period, just like the Book of Mormon tried to write Christianity into the Old Testament. Finally, while delivering a sermon on the 10th of March, 1844, in Nauvoo, Illinois, Joseph Smith again drew on his story of angelic ordination to support his new teachings on the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah, and Messiah. Smith based his comments on the angel's words to Zacharias in Luke 1.17, that the unborn John the Baptist shall go before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. The angel alluded to the prophecy in Malachi 4, 5-6, through 6, concerning the coming of Elijah. Elias is the Greek form of the Hebrew Elijah. Building on this passage, Smith linked Elias with the Aaronic priesthood, Elijah with the Melchizedek priesthood, and power to seal in the temple in connection with the endowment and baptism for the dead, and Messiah with the power of Godhood and creation. In discussing the spirit of Elias as a preparatory power, Smith made the surprising claim that the angel who ordained him and Cowdery to the Aaronic priesthood in May 1829 also told him it was the spirit of Elias. I went into the woods to inquire of the Lord by prayer, his will concerning me. And I saw an angel, and he laid his hands upon my head, and ordained me to be a priest after the order of Aaron, and to hold the keys of this priesthood, which office was to preach repentance and baptism for the remission of sins. Also, to baptize, but was informed by the angel, that this office did not extend to the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, that this office was a greater work and was to be given afterwards, but that my ordination was a preparatory work or a going before, which was the spirit of Elias, for the spirit of Elias was a going before to prepare the way for a greater, which was the case with John the Baptist. Franklin D. Richards reported that Smith related the vision of his ordination to the priesthood of Aaron on the Susquehanna River to preach the preparatory gospel. This, said the angel, is the spirit of Elias. Here we see Smith adding anachronism upon anachronism. Although Smith had previously commented on the spirit of Elias as a forerunner and restorer of the gospel, he had not connected it with the Aaronic priesthood, nor had he claimed the concept had come from an angel. Smith and Cowdery were not content to invent angelic ordinations to bolster authority claims and hold the church together. They also drew on them to support Cowdery's ordination as assistant president, and now Smith's teachings on the spirit of Elias. Responding to problems surrounding priesthood restoration, apologists have tended to focus on the element of late disclosure and the testimonies of the Whitmers and McClellan, offering little more than variations of Joseph Smith's original excuse that he and Cowdery kept silent because of persecution in harmony. 
This was the approach of Brigham Young University professor Richard L. Anderson and Ronald O. Barney, an employee at the Church History Library and volume editor of the Joseph Smith Papers Project, who appeared in Season 1 of the documentary The Joseph Smith Papers, which aired on the KJAZZ TV channel in the Salt Lake City area in 2008 and now widely distributed on DVD. Episode 9 was devoted to the restoration of the priesthoods. They seem to think that it is merely a matter of excusing Smith's and Cowdery's five-year silence, but there is far more to explain. Like why angelic ordinations weren't mentioned in the Articles and Covenants, why they were withheld from believers, why they were not mentioned when Cowdery organized the Quorum of Twelve, why they were surreptitiously inserted into earlier revelations, why anachronistic elements such as the terms Aaronic Priesthood and Melchizedek Priesthood were incorporated in the stories, why Smith and Cowdery tried to support their stories of angelic ordination by altering 1833 blessings, why Cowdery and Smith felt free to make anachronistic additions to the stories to serve later purposes, such as justifying Cowdery's ordination as assistant president and to support Joseph Smith's Nauvoo teachings on the spirit of Elias. Apologists should realize that excusing Smith's silence doesn't even begin to deal with the problems surrounding these stories. The overwhelming weight of the evidence points to invention and fabrication by Smith and Cowdery in the mid-1830s. The cavalier manner in which Cowdery and Smith added anachronistic elements to serve later needs and manipulated related documents shows that they were not drawing on memories of real events. Which raises the question, if Smith and Cowdery didn't treat angelic ordination stories as real experiences, why should we?